Chapter 9. Theft. They wandered around the Reef Centre for an hour, looking at trainers and computer games that they didn't have any money to buy. It wasn't as boring as school, but it wasn't exactly exciting either. When they got hungry, they got stuff off a Mexican stand in the food court. Mmm, my dad's loaded, Junior said, taking a chunk out of his burrito. But he's so tight. Like, he says he doesn't want me turning into a spoiled brat. I'm telling you, half the poor scum living down the Thornton estate get more cool stuff than I do. That's where I live, James said. Oh, sorry, Junior smiled. No offence, none taken. Actually, it's quite a laugh hanging out on Thornton. I was down there in the holidays and some kids started chucking bricks at the police. James laughed. <laughs> oh, excellent. Oh, it was brilliant. One cop car got the windscreen smashed and everything. I go to the boxing club down there as well. Have you been round there? No. My dad sponsors it, actually. You should come along. Everyone who goes boxing is a nutter. It's a good crowd. Yeah, maybe I'll try it, James said. Does boxing hurt? Only when you get punched, Junior said, grinning. So that's something you should definitely try to avoid. So how come your dad's loaded? James asked. What does he do? James knew what Keith Moore did, of course, but he wondered what Junior would say. Oh, he's a businessman. Import and export. He's a millionaire, actually. James acted impressed. Seriously? No kidding. That's why I get so pissed off he won't give me decent pocket money. There are six PlayStation games I want really bad. I'll get a couple of them for my birthday, but that's not till November. We'll steal them, James said. Junior laughed. <laughs> yeah, but knowing my luck, I'd get busted. Now, I know a few things about shoplifting, James said. My mum was into it, before she died. Did she get nicked much? Never, James said. Shoplifting is a snip, as long as you use forward planning and kitchen foil. How many times have you done it? Junior asked. Hundreds, James lied. In fact, the only time James had tried shoplifting was when he was in care shortly after his mum died. He'd ended up in a police cell. So what's the tinfoil for? Junior asked. I'll show you, if you want to go for it. I'm in if you reckon it's safe. James gurgled up the last of his coke. There's no guarantee, but I've never been caught before. He reckoned shoplifting was a good way to cement his friendship with Junior. If they got away with it, he'd be a hero and he could invite himself round to Keith Moore's house to play the games. It would be trickier if they got caught, but the experience of getting in trouble together would probably bring them closer. James wouldn't get in real trouble with the police, because they would arrest and charge James Beckett, a boy who didn't really exist. As soon as the mission ended, Cherub would pull James Beckett's criminal file and have it destroyed, so no fingerprint or DNA evidence would ever be linked back to James's real identity. James bought a roll of tinfoil in one of those everything-for-a-pound shops. They locked themselves in a disabled toilet. James gave Junior the stuff out of his backpack and lined it with a double layer of the shiny aluminium. What does it do? Junior asked. You know those alarms that go off when you take something out of a shop? Junior nodded. They're metal detectors, James explained. They put those sticky metal tag thingies on everything and the alarm goes off when it detects them. So, won't the metal foil make it go off? It only goes off when it detects the right-sized piece of metal. Otherwise, it would ring for every umbrella and belt buckle. So, as long as you wrap the security tags inside something made of metal, the alarm thinks it's something different and doesn't go off. Genius, Junior said, breaking into a grin. All we need is a shop where they keep the PlayStation discs in the boxes, not behind the counter. Game World does, Junior said. We'll have to go in separately. I'll go up and stick the games in my pack. Your job is to distract the security guard or any staff that come near me. How? Well, anything to take their attention off me. Just walk up and ask where something is. You sure this isn't going to go wrong? Junior asked excitedly. If we get caught, my dad will crucify me. Trust me, James said. Besides, you're only a lookout. I'm the one taking the big risk. James felt confident as Junior led him through the shopping centre towards Gameworld. The security guards stood in the entrance. 
James went straight up the back to the PlayStation games. His foil-lined backpack was already unzipped. He found four of the games Junior wanted, then realised he might as well grab a few for himself while he was taking the risk. It was dead easy. The security guard was picking his nose, and the guy at the checkout was texting on his mobile. James zipped the pack up and slung it over his back. Junior stood in the doorway, with the security guard pointing out the DVDs to him. James headed towards the exit as nonchalantly as he could, but his heart was thumping. As he passed through the detector, an alarm went berserk and a mechanical voice boomed out. We're sorry, an inventory tag has been left on your item. Please return to the store. We're sorry, an inventory. The guard took hold of James and tried to drag him into the shop. Junior could have kept his head down and nobody would have been able to prove he was involved. So James was impressed when he charged towards the security guard and punched him in the side of the head. James kneed the guard in the stomach and started running, with Junior a few paces behind. The security guard in the store opposite had seen the whole show and came after them. When James glanced back over his shoulder, the guard was shouting into his walkie-talkie, requesting backup. You tit! Junior shouted as shoppers dived out of their way. What a great plan! James couldn't work out what he'd done wrong. Two security guards came out of a department store up ahead, blocking their path and forcing them to cut into a women's clothing store. A woman with a buggy went flying into a display of leggings as James crashed into her. The store was crammed with rails of clothing that brushed against James as he ran. Junior stumbled. One of the security guards got a hand on him, but he spun away and recovered his balance. James burst out of the fire exit at the back of the shop, setting off another alarm. He'd hoped the door would lead out onto the street, but he'd emerged into the central concourse of the shopping centre. There was a big fountain and a stand where they did temporary exhibitions. The yellow banner hanging over the exhibition stand sent James into shock. Bedfordshire Police Theft Prevention Squad. Find out how to protect your home and car from crime. There was a long fold-out table with three policemen behind it handing out crime prevention leaflets. Holy shit, Junior gasped, stopping in his tracks. With the police up ahead and security guards behind, their chances looked about nil. James considered surrendering, but Junior noticed a door with a toilet sign a few metres away and barged it open. He led James down a narrow corridor, with six pairs of men's shoes clattering after them. They passed the entrance to the ladies' toilet and crashed through a fire door into the dim confines of a multi-storey car park. They sped towards the lift, but there was no time to wait for it. Instead, they scrambled onto the staircase and ran down, leaping three steps at a time, fueled by adrenaline. James twisted his ankle, but he didn't have time to think about the pain or the fact that if he tumbled, he'd smash his head open on bare concrete. The policemen were more cautious on the stairs, and the boys had gained ground by the time they booted open a set of doors that led into a sunlit alleyway. There were massive steel bins and boxes of rubbish piled around them. They clambered over everything, reaching the front of the shopping centre as the police emerged through the doors at the bottom of the stairs. The security guards had given up. There was a pedestrian crossing with two lanes of waiting traffic. James saw the green man flashing and they made a dash for it. They ran into the outdoor car park, crouching low and jogging between the bumpers of two lines of parked cars. The police got stranded on the other side of the road, waiting for the lights to change. One cop tried to stop the traffic with a hand signal and nearly got splattered by a motorbike. By the time the cops had halted the traffic and made it across, James and Junior were crouching behind a car a hundred metres away. The three cops stood on the pavement by the car park, staring hopelessly at row after row of parked cars. The boys kept low until they came to the far side of the car park. They pushed themselves through shrubs, emerging onto a narrow pavement beside a fast-moving dual carriageway. Junior started running. Whoa, James said. Keep cool. Junior turned around. What? Walk, James said. It looks less dodgy if we're spotted. They walked nervously for 20 minutes, looking back over their shoulders and having miniature heart attacks every time they spotted a white car. When they noticed a bus coming, they sprinted to the stop and hopped on. They were upstairs and sat at the back, well away from the other passengers. James finally felt safe. Oh, sorry about that, he said breathlessly. You're not pissed off with me, are you? Junior burst out laughing. 
<laughs> that was mental. The look on those cops' faces when we lost them. Oh, man. I'm an idiot, James said. You know what I did? When I put the games in, I must have pushed the foil down the bag so it wasn't covering them over. Who cares now? Junior grinned. Gimme, gimme, gimme. James unzipped his pack and pulled out nine PlayStation games. Junior read out the price stickers. 40, 40, 25, 35. How much is that? 140. 38, 24, and three at 35. 307 quid, James said. You add fast, Junior said. Over 300 quid's worth of games. That's so cool. We've got to do it again sometime. I don't know, James said. I'm not sure if my underwear can take the strain. You're late, James, Zara said. Dinner's nearly ready. Kerry and Kyle were sitting at the kitchen table while Zara did frozen lasagna in the oven. Sorry, James said. You could have rung us, Zara said. We were all worried. Kerry looked up. Where were you? I didn't see you at lunchtime. I was around, James said defensively. So how was school? Zara asked. Oh, you know, James shrugged. Same old, same old. Boring as hell. Zara wouldn't have minded that he'd bunked off with Junior, but James didn't want her finding out about the shoplifting and the chase. If cherubs steal something, or make money while they're on a mission, they're supposed to either return the goods or donate them to charity. James had no plans to give away five top PlayStation games after going through so much exertion stealing them. How did you get along with Junior? Zara asked. Really good, James said. He's my sort of person. I reckon we would have ended up mates even if I hadn't tried. Where's Nicole? Doing homework with April Moore and a bunch of other girls, Kyle said. Wow, James smiled. She's a fast worker. How did you two get on with your targets? Erin Moore and her weird friends chucked paper at me and started calling me peg leg because of my limp, Kerry said miserably. Ringo's a swat, Kyle said. Nice kid, taking his GCSEs very seriously. The thing is, I reckon he's too straight to be involved in his dad's drug business. James, Kerry said, why is there tin foil sticking out of your backpack? What? James gasped. Kerry leaned towards the pack. James whipped it away before she got a chance to see inside. You've been up to something, Kerry grinned. What's in there? Nothing, James said, jumping up from the table. I better go and, um, I'll give Lauren a call before dinner's ready. Kyle and Kerry exchanged looks as James thumped upstairs to his room. Tinfoil? Kerry whispered, not wanting Zara to hear. Don't ask me, Kyle shrugged. But he's been up to something, that's for sure. Chapter 10. Punch. It was Friday after school. James, Kyle, Kerry and Nicole sat on the living room couches in their school uniforms, drinking cans of Coke. The TV was on, but nobody was watching. James looked at Kyle. I'm going boxing tonight with Junior. You want to come? <laughs> you in a boxing ring? Kerry giggled. That's something I'd pay money to see. James clucked. It's training, stupid. They don't make you fight on the first night. I'll pass on getting punched in the head, Kyle said. I got invited to a party. Oh, James said. Thanks for inviting me. It's Ringo Moore and his mates, Kyle said. Year 10 and 11 kids. They won't want the likes of you biting their ankles. I'm meeting April at the youth club, Nicole said. The boxing gym is upstairs. So, Kerry, James said, breaking into a grin. I'm going out with Junior Moore tonight. Kyle's partying with Ringo Moore. And Nicole's at the youth club with April Moore. What are you and Aaron Moore doing? Ha ha, very funny, Kerry said miserably. Aaron is the biggest geek. There's this student Spanish teacher. Miss Perez, James said. I've got her as well. That's her, Kerry said. Erin and her little friends wound her up so much, they made her run out of the classroom in tears. I felt really sorry for her. <laughs> yeah, James giggled. Perez is always crying. My class had her bawling three times in one lesson. It was so funny. Kerry looked mad. James, that's horrible. How must that poor woman feel? James shrugged. Who cares? She's only a teacher. 
You know what, James? Kerry snapped. Teachers have feelings the same as anyone else. Whatever, James said. I know you're only angry because you can't get on with Aaron, and you'll probably get your body kicked off this mission. Oh, shut up, James, Kerry shouted, putting her palm in front of her face. I spend all day stuck in a class with a bunch of stupid, noisy morons. I don't want to come home and deal with another one. Oh, <laughs> touchy, touchy, James giggled. Kyle gave James a nudge. Leave it out, eh? James realised he'd overdone it. He was getting a filthy look off Nicole as well. Sorry, Kerry, James said. But you were taking the mickey out of me going boxing just a second ago. Kerry didn't answer. She just scowled into the bottom of her empty Coke can. You don't have to sit here all night watching telly, Kerry, Nicole said. You can come to the youth centre with me if you want. I don't want your pity, Nicole, Kerry said tersely. Our mission briefing says if you can't get on with your target, you should try and get involved in KMG through another kid. So, for your information, I won't be sitting in front of the TV. I'll be at the youth centre with someone tonight, the same as Nicole and Muhammad Ali over there. Kerry got off the sofa and stomped up to her room. Kyle reached over and punched James's shoulder. Ow, what the hell was that for? James asked furiously. Being an insensitive pig, Kyle said. You know what a big deal Kerry makes about being the best at everything? Jesus, James said, rubbing his arm. I was only having a laugh. It's not my fault she's so touchy. Go up and apologise, Kyle said. I better not, James said. She probably wants to be on her own. James noticed the look he was getting off Nicole. Okay then, James huffed, standing up. I'll go and say sorry. James went upstairs. Kerry and Nicole's room was at the end of the corridor. As James got closer, he started to bottle it. Kerry had a violent temper, and he didn't want to get on the wrong end of it. For the first time ever, James was happy to hear Joshua crying. He leaned into Ewart and Zara's room, making sure they weren't in there, then walked over to the cot and picked the baby up. Joshua rested his head on James's shoulder and changed his bawling to a gentler, sucking kind of noise. Come on, James said, rocking Joshua gently. Let's find Mummy. He went down to the kitchen. Ewart was at the table. Cheers for picking him up, James, Ewart said. Zara's just gone down the shop for some bread. Get his bottle warmed up, James said. I'll take him into the living room. He likes watching the telly. Ewart smiled at James. Joshua still won't let Kyle or the girls go near him. You know why I think he likes you? James shrugged. Why? You've got blonde hair, the same as me and Zara. Maybe, James said. He carried Joshua through and sat next to Nicole on the sofa. Look who's here, Nicole said, grinning and wiggling Joshua's big toe. Since he'd been on the mission, James had learned something about girls. If you want them to like you, don't worry about buying gifts or saying the right thing or where to take them. What you need to do is grab the nearest brat and stick it on your lap. Nicole, who'd been furious at James a few minutes earlier, shuffled up close to him on the couch. You know, James, Nicole beamed, someday you're going to make a really good dad. The stairs leading up to the boxing club had signed photos and newspaper cuttings of boxers James had never heard of on the walls. The door at the top of the stairs creaked and James got a nose full of 30 degree heat and old sweat. About 20 guys were working out. Dark patches on their clothes, lifting weights, punching bags. James felt awkward, imagining they were all sizing him up, estimating how many milliseconds it would take to punch him out. A massive guy stopped a set of crunches and started mopping his bald head with a towel. New fish? he asked, looking at James. James nodded. I, um... The guy pointed his thumb. You want the back room, with the other kids. Try not to tread on anyone. James had to step over gym mats and barbells to get through. The back room was bigger, with 20-odd boys aged between 9 and 14 working out. Two young coaches stood in a ring up the back, mucking about and taking punches off some little kids. James recognised Junior, Dell, and a couple of guys he'd seen around Thornton Estate and at school. You Junior's new pal? A voice asked from behind. James turned. The guy sat in a plastic chair. 
He wore tracksuit bottoms and a stained vest. His shoulders were a mat of wiry grey hair. Even though the guy was 30 years past his prime, he still didn't look like a man you wanted to mess with. I'm Ken, the guy growled. If you're here for the night, it's 50 pence. Junior said it's cheaper if I get a monthly ticket, James said. 50 pence for tonight, Ken said. I don't want to rob you. This is too much like hard work for most kids. They don't come through that door more than once or twice. If you're one of the ones who sticks it, I'll take what you've already paid off the monthly pass. James nodded and dug some coins out of his shorts. Go see your friend Junior and try to follow what he does, Ken said. You're here to train. That means you don't stand around talking, you don't mess around, and you don't make jokes. Any kid starts a fight without my say-so, and I'll give the nod to someone who will make them sorry. You got that? James nodded. Don't I get coaching or something? Ken laughed. <laughs> I sit here with my eyes open. Give it a week or so. Follow what the others do. When I think you're ready, I'll get one of the trainees to start you off with a little sparring. James wandered over to Junior. Enjoy the lecture? Junior asked, grinning. Junior, Dell, and a couple of other guys trained in a group. Everything was a competition. How many push-ups or crunches, how fast you could skip, how many times you could punch the hanging ball in 30 seconds. Cherub training had made James fit. He could hold his own at everything except skipping, which he'd only ever tried in PE lessons years earlier. Everyone except James got a turn in the ring, either sparring with each other or getting coached by Calvin and Marcus, the two brutal-looking 17-year-olds the club employed as apprentice coaches. When they were all half dead, the group piled into the locker room, showered off the sweat and put on fresh clothes. On their way out, Ken blocked James's way with his leg. You coming back? Ken asked. I'd like to, James nodded, still out of breath, if that's okay. You've done some kind of martial arts training, haven't you? Yeah, karate and judo. How could you tell? You're in good shape, and you can punch, Ken said. But a boxer needs fast feet as well. You want to be able to skip 150 times a minute. Take this home and practice half an hour a day. James took hold of a frayed skipping rope. He stuck it in his carrier bag, on top of his damp kit. Junior slapped him on the back as they went down the staircase. He must think you've got talent, James. I kept coming here for three weeks before he said a word, and my dad practically owns the joint. James couldn't help smiling, though it was hardly surprising he showed promise after all the combat training he'd done at Cherub. You coming down the youth club with me and Dell? Junior asked. It's packed out with girls, Friday night. The youth club was on the ground floor, under the gym. It was supposed to be a disco, but the music wasn't very loud and nobody was dancing. James sat with Junior and Dell on some slashed up seats in a dark corner. There were plenty of boys and plenty of girls, but everyone sat in single sex groups. So, Junior said, which babes are us three studs going to snap up tonight? Dell looked at his watch. Not me. I'm off to work once I've drunk this. Dell always had money, and James thought it probably came from delivering drugs. He straightened up in his seat, sensing an opportunity to get information, but trying not to make it obvious he was prying. Work? he asked. At this time of night? Junior burst out laughing. <laughs> ah, the voice of innocence. I work for KMG, Dell said. KM what? James said. Keith Moore's gang. Dell explained. I deliver coke for Junior's daddy. Who wants coke at this time on Friday? Not Coca-Cola, you wazzock, Junior said. Cocaine. James acted like he was surprised. Cocaine? Isn't that seriously illegal? You told me your dad was an import-export. He is, Junior said. Imports drugs, exports cash. Hell, James grinned. No wonder he's loaded. Dell went into his backpack. He pulled out a small polythene bag filled with white powder. Cocaine, he explained. James grinned as he took the packet and inspected it. Don't let everyone see it, you moron, Dell gasped, knocking James's hand out of the air. Sorry, James said. So how much is this? One gram in every bag. They give me ten grams at a time, then they ring me on my mobile and tell me where and when to deliver it. 
How much do you make? 15%, Dell said. This is 60 a gram, so I get nine quid. If I work Friday and Saturday evenings, I can easily make 100 quid. Sometimes though, like at Christmas, you get people loading up for office parties and stuff. I had this one guy who lived two streets away from me. He was buying 10 grams at a time. 90 quid for a 10-minute bike ride. It was beautiful. Do you blow all the money? Dell shook his head. I used to, but you end up wasting it all on junk. Now I only spend 20 pounds a week. I stick the rest in my savings account, and when I'm 18, I'm going to buy a ticket and go off backpacking. James looked at Junior. So how come you're always broke? Dell burst out laughing. <laughs> oh, this baby's not allowed to go anywhere near drugs. Junior explained miserably. My dad's paranoid that he'll get arrested. If I get caught with drugs, it gives the police an excuse to question dad and search our house. Oh, that's a shame, James said. Tell me about it, Junior said bitterly. My dad's a millionaire and half my mates are making a packet selling coke. What have I got? Holes in my jeans and supermarket brand football boots. Can't you do it on the sly? James asked. Won't happen, Junior said. The word is out. Anyone who gets me or Ringo involved in the drug business will be in serious trouble if my dad cops them. <laughs> so you're stuffed, James laughed. You reckon there's any chance I can get in on this delivery lark? Dell shrugged. I'll go upstairs and have a word with Kelvin if you like. I don't know if he needs anyone right now, but I can try and get him to set you up with a few bags of coke and your own phone. I've already got a mobile, James said. Dell shook his head. You have to use the phone they give you, so the police can't trace it. But there's definitely a chance. I haven't got a clue, Dell said. All I can do is put a word in. Thanks, James said. Dell stood up. Anyway, I've got a nine o'clock delivery, so I better dive home and pick up my bike. I'll see you two hard up losers at school on Monday. James smiled. Yeah, see you. I'll be thinking about you sweating away on your bike in a couple of hours, Junior said when I've got my hand up some girl's shirt. In your dreams, Junior, Dell shouted as he walked towards the exit. James shook his head, grinning in false disbelief. I can't believe your dad is a drug dealer. Who cares, Junior said. Do you want to try and get off with someone? They both glanced around. Look at that bird sitting by the coke machine, Junior gasped. I've not seen her here before. James turned around. He'd guessed it was Nicole before he even saw her. She's reserved for me, he said. That's my stepsister. You can't get off with your sister, you pervert. Stepsister, James said. We're not blood relatives. Why don't you go for the one sitting next to her? She looks like a right dog. That's my twin, you cheeky git, Junior said. And you better not call April a dog again, unless you want a slap. April had her hair done differently from the surveillance photos. James hadn't recognised her. Tell you who else is good looking, Junior said. Pity she's already with someone. Who? James asked. At the table behind our sisters. That Chinese looking girl with long black hair. She's well tasty. James peered over. All he could see was the back of the girl's head. Then she turned and he saw her in profile. That's my other stepsister. James gasped. That's Kerry. Who's that she's with? Dinesh Singh. He lives up my road. His dad runs a firm that makes those microwave meals for supermarkets. So, you want to go over? Junior asked. I'll go for Nicole and you can have a run at April. She's not too picky, to be honest with you, so even you might stand a chance. Jesus, James said, feeling like his head was going to burst with jealousy. Dinesh just put his arm around her. What's the problem? Do you fancy all your sisters or something? It's just, Carrie's really young. How old is she? Junior asked. Twelve? Junior burst out laughing. <laughs> we're twelve. Yeah, James said. But we're in year eight. She's only a year seven. If you ask me, Junior said, it's none of your business what your stepsister is up to. But if it makes you feel better, Dinesh is a weed. Just go over there and slap him one. I've a good mind to, James said. This was a total lie. 
Kerry would break him into 50 million pieces if he even thought about it. Anyway, Junior said, I'm not sitting here all night. Are you going to ask April out or not? There you go, James shrugged. I'm not in the mood. April Moore was okay looking, and being friendly with her would be good for the mission, but James couldn't get Kerry out of his head. Junior pulled up a chair next to Nicole and started chatting her up. James sat by himself and kept glancing over to see what Kerry was up to with Dinesh. He realised he couldn't sit on his own all night being jealous of Dinesh and decided to go across to April, but company arrived before he got a chance. It was Calvin and Marcus, the two coaches he'd seen at boxing club. They were both over six feet tall and solid muscle. They sat either side of James, squashing him even though there was plenty of room. I'm Calvin, the black one said. He pulled a mobile phone out of his pocket and stuck it on the table. Dell tells me you're interested in doing deliveries. James nodded. I could do with the cash. Dell said you're a solid kid, Calvin continued. What are you going to say if the cops pick you up holding drugs? Nothing, of course. Calvin nodded. That's right. You don't know us. You ain't never seen us. Tell them you found the drugs in a bush and stick to that story no matter how they try to mess with you. You know what happens if you grass us up? I get beaten up. Cut up, more likely, Kelvin said. And that's just for starters. They'll send people around your house and start on your family. Smash the furniture, batter your mum and dad. Dell said you had two sisters. They won't look so pretty after we finish with them. So you better understand, James. Even if there's some massive cop threatening to lock you up and throw away the key, you better keep your trap shut. Don't worry, James said. I'm no grass. You got a good bike? It's pretty crap, actually. Good, Calvin said. You don't want nothing fancy or you'll get mugged. How cool are your parents about you being out late? It's okay until about half ten. Marcus, set the kid up with three bags. I think we'll give him a trial run. Marcus got three bags of cocaine out of his tracksuit. I want you on call school nights, Calvin said. Monday through Thursday. That means you keep your phone switched on and you're always ready to go. We don't want to hear that you're grounded or you're busy doing something. Whenever they call, you jump to it. Can't I do weekends? James asked. Dell reckons that's when you make the real money. Everyone starts at the bottom with weekday deliveries and no regular customers. The powers that be will see how you do. If you're reliable and you deliver fast, you get moved on to better paid work. Questions? I've only got three bags of coke. How do I get more? James asked. There's people at your school. We'll arrange for you to meet up with them when you need to. What if someone tries to rob me or something? James asked. If you lose the stuff or get mugged, that's your problem, and you owe us for what you lost. If the customer tries any funny business, don't sweat it. Give the customer whatever they want, and some of our muscle will show them the error of their ways. Calvin and his silent pal got up from the table. One last thing, Calvin said. If you're out late, you'll get hassled sooner or later. Never carry more coke than you need to. A lot of kids carry knives, but if you ask me, you're safer throwing the stuff on the ground and legging it 